Oh, You're late. No. Dance majors. Dance majors. <sighs> Engineer majors. No, we get the money. Um, somebody from the administration. They left it in the normal room that we meet. Well, guys, I was going to show you a demonstration of using the whiteboard, but I'm getting some glare, and so my camera is not going to not going to do the trick today. Um, so we'll just go with a uh, short little presentation. Can you point it at the screen? Um, I probably could, but I have to. You have to recreate your draw the square. Okay. Yeah, and the idea was to, to have that, and it worked in, in the other lab. But I think just I need to do some, also, some things uh, with lighting. This picture is good. Can try it, and I don't want to take up your guys' time too much. But well, we can try turning it up. Let me see. Let's see. Let me give it one more shot. So what you're seeing here um, is it's basically taking a picture of this whiteboard and uh, then it, I'm, I'm converting it into a, a monochrome image. And uh, what I'm checking is to see if my walls are actually showing up like they should. So this is what, this is what we're seeing after the image was turned to monochrome and had a few different things done with it. And I'm not catching this top part of the walls. Right? I think I can Oh. I think Jeff's going to be the hero. I will take my card. If uh, Preston had his little toolbox, I imagine he's got electric tape in there. Um, um, we'll do it on the back of this. So Jason, do you mind uh, kind of describing to people what you are working on for your robotics uh, yeah, research this is, project? Uh, this started out um, as kind of a, a rough idea for a project uh, for Professor Sodom's class. Um, and basically the concept was is to make a, a robotic labyrinth. Um, if you've ever seen the uh, the old wooden tables with the steel ball bearing, you have to tilt it to, to roll the ball through the maze. Um, and a few other people had tried this, but I wanted to, to take it from a different uh, point in the fact that not only are you controlling a ball through the maze, but the maze can be generated by the user. So uh, the previous projects that I've done research on, they've all had a dedicated path or a set maze with, with rigid walls that couldn't be moved. So they could program in the path that they wanted this ball to take and then try to move the table, um, in essence, to get the ball to travel through that path. Um, what I wanted to do with the image processing is, uh, is allow the user to populate the walls, and also tell it whatever starting position that they want. And so the, the software not only has to move the ball through the maze, but it has to calculate the shortest possible route uh, for the ball to take. And if we get it working, you guys can play with it and uh, kind of mess around and see if you can stump it. Oops. All right, we're getting.
I will scan it and send it to John. If that was part of it. I don't worry about the cake. He likes it, John. <laughs> 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 Who is signing the cake? I mean, it's blood on it. Yeah, we're on the bleeding edge here, so. Not just the cutting edge, the <coughs> bleeding. Our teacher came to her own PowerPoint. <laughs> Last try. If it doesn't work this time, hey, there we go. Kerpow! So now what I'm doing <laughs> is I'm telling it uh, it's uh, target position. That we're not, uh, not worried about the top of it. Alright. Well, we'll see if it works, but we'll do the PowerPoint first. And uh, just tell you guys a little bit about it. Um, so the concept is some very basic general pathway. Um, a lot of different things uh, can use this. Um, So you basically get from getting from here to there. Um, it's pretty simple for humans to do. Uh, you can be you know, walking down the street, know where you need to go, just from your sense of direction, uh, your orientation, what direction you're headed. Um, but the hardest part is, is figuring out how to get to a place when you don't, when you know where you're going, or sorry, when you don't know where you're going. Um, so basically, if you're in a city street and somebody said, find, uh, find, Chase Bank, and you have no idea, it could be in front of you, behind you, to the right of you, to the left of you, uh, it's kind of a shot in the dark. You can start to run one way, but you might get there and find out that it's not there. Uh, without any sort of external input or, or prior knowledge of how to get there, it becomes kind of complicated, uh, even for humans to do. Um, for robots, it's even more difficult because uh, you have to kind of import your surroundings. Um, the benefit to, to solving a maze is that you can see it from, from up above. Um, and so you can kind of say, all right, well, I might have, you know, all these different turns, but I know where my final destination is. Um, if you've ever watched a mouse try to solve a maze, they'll, they'll walk through the maze and they'll hit a wall and they'll, you know, see it's not there. And so they'll turn back and then choose a different path. Um, that's, that's kind of similar to what's called a depth-first search. Um, 
It's an algorithm for, for traversing and searching uh, any number of different things. Um, you can consider it, you know, searching different roads or, or, or a path or even a graph. Um, basically, you start at your starting point and you travel down one path, like I said, until you either reach the end of it or you reach your goal. If you reach the end of it and haven't reached your goal, then you turn around and basically you head back or, or just take off at your next possible turn. Um, and so you're basically doing this all through the entire, uh, entire graph or entire area that you have to search, which can take an extreme amount of time. Um, even for computers, it can take in a, lot of, a lot of processing power for an extended period of time. Um, it was first investigated uh, in the 19th century uh, by Charles Pierre Tremont. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, but as a strategy for solving mazes. Um, and this is kind of the idea is that you would head down this path. The, the gray parts are, are, are a blockage, if you will. Um, so you head down this way and taking, for example, all right turns first. So you come all the way down three, four, five, six. Up, oh, can't go here. So your next possible turn from the left was right here, and this gets a seven. Um, and then basically, once you eventually find that node that you're looking for, you can retrace your steps back uh, and go from the highest number to the lowest, even if you're skipping numbers throughout there. So if we found it here, we go, all right, we're at 10, or 11, there's 10. What's the next lowest number connected to here? It would be the seven. And so you can find your way back, and then ultimately you have your path. Um, a breath for search is kind of on the same lines as that, and, and maybe Dr. Saga can correct me if I'm wrong, but basically you're, you're doing kind of the same thing where you're starting at a root, um, except instead of going all the way down one possible line, you say, okay, I'm at this node, um, which nodes around me are clear, or, or, or have a, an availability to, to go down that path. And so you would you know, essentially mark those nodes and add them to, we'll say, a checklist of to-dos. And so, instead of making it all the way down one path and finding out you went the wrong way, now you've started at one, and then you've, if you had three other possible options, you would check all three of those on your next step. Um, so it can kind of limit your amount of time. Uh, sometimes the, the, um, the depth first search, if you happen to be lucky enough to choose the, the right path the first time, can be uh, very fast. But it depends on the complexity of your maze or the area that you're trying to traverse. If you only have two possible options, a, uh, a depth first search is not a bad, a bad concept. But if you have 300 different options and it takes you know, 15 milliseconds or, or however long to run all the way down one and then run all the way down the next, you're basically gambling with how long it's going to take you to get there. This kind of limits it a little because you're spreading out uh, as you go. Um, this is also kind of known as wave propagation. And you can kind of see here, if you were to start here, you would tabulate each uh, possible route with a, with, a, with a one plus what your current position is. Um, and then from here, so we go one, and then if we wanted to get to this cell, it would be two steps. So one, two. If you wanted to get to this step, no matter how you go, it's going to be three. You can go one, two, three, or one, two, three and so forth. Once you finally reach your target destination, though, then you can just tr track back on the, uh, the least uh, numbered cells. So you start on T, and then you seven, six, five, four. And, uh, and each of these is actually the same amount of distance. So if you were to go this way, that would be the same, or this way, that would be the same distance. So it's basically pick whichever one you want. Those are all equivalent in the uh, distance that it takes to get to your target. Um, <clears throat> reducing some of that, though, you can start and do some different things. You can start at the beginning and at the end, uh, as kind of shown here. So whenever you reach the middle, um, you obviously have made one complete path. Um, so that takes a little bit less time. You can also frame your area, but that doesn't necessarily work for mazes because you might have a, a start and a finish here, but your path might go out of this area. Mm -hmm. GPS routing is kind of similar to these approaches, except they use what's called a, a weighted grid. Um, and, and more, the, the GPS nowadays 
are getting more complex and, and they're allowed to, to make uh, more assumptions or, or delegate more weighting based on different areas. For example, you might have a street that's 20 miles an hour speed limit versus a street that's 50 miles an hour. So the street that's 20 miles an hour would have a, a more negative aspect to it or, or, or not appealing. Um, it's kind of like if you were trying to get a robot to do something and uh, it, it's either like a reward or, or a discipline. Um, so, oh, well, here's a, here's a 20 mile an hour street. I can go down this, but it's going to kind of hurt me a little bit. Or here's a 50 mile an hour street. It might be a little bit longer, but it doesn't hurt me as much as going down the 20 mile an hour street. So this is just kind of more example on, on working with a weighted uh, grid. Um, basically showing that you can come here and then, you know, just depending upon what your path looks like, uh, you can choose the better route. And that's pretty much the gist of, of what I've come up with with this. <coughs> um, let's see, we'll try once more to see if this thing will work. Now, I'm reading some um, articles, and it talks about things like the Manhattan distance. Uh -huh. Is And I don't fully understand all of that. Did In your research, did you... Did it... I believe the Manhattan distance is actually very similar uh, to, to a breath for a search, or, or even well, for either of those, but it's... it's Man the distance Manhattan versus. distance just refers to distance the way that he's calculating it. It the means of instead stacks. of going... The shortest distance between here and there, I have to go only east, west, north, or south all okay. the time. So the reason why it's called Manhattan distance is because that's how you go from place to place in Manhattan. You have to drive down this road and then drive down this road. Mm -hmm. Drive down that road. Okay. That makes a bit more sense. So it treats everything like a grid rather than a surface. Yeah, you can't. It's not a distance as the crow flies. It's a distance as you would drive there on the road. <coughs> okay. So, in essentially all fields of navigation, do they use that, or are they able to use systems that do as the bird flies? Well, it, it depends on your application. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if you're trying to figure out how far it is from here to there in your autonomous road vehicle, you might want to use a Manhattan distance. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to figure it out for your autonomous air vehicle, you might want to use the Euclidean distance. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Well, that kind of makes sense, because in air you're not really going to have obstacles. Yeah. You feel me? Huh? You feel me? Well, anyway, what this does, if I can get it to work, uh, is it does a breadth per search. Um, let's see. If not, I promise I'll come another time with it all set up and you guys Sounds good. But I'll, I'll vouch. I've seen it in action. It, it's pretty cool. What happens if you turn on the folding light? Oh, that might, uh, that might really help. Actually, uh, which, which I think there's the one. There we go. I think I just... See if that did it. There's one over here that's a sword on it. Oh. That is one, one problem with image processing. There's a lot of different... Uh, a lot of different things can change all of... Everything you've set up. Uh, just different lighting conditions. And make things not work or work. Or, mm -hmm. Requires different shutter speeds, different contrast ratios. Oh, that made it worse. Yeah.
It's my techno less going. Alright. Well, unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to be able to get it to work for, uh, for this occasion. But uh, in the future, I've, I've, what I would like to do is have it projecting uh, an image, and then, then we can adjust it from there. And, and it would show you directly on the screen where the, where the path would be taken. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't think uh, at this time, just the, the change in the situation is... Non-ideal not conditions. Not ideal for well, thanks. Uh, do you mind uh, just kind of giving us a brief, a brief overview on your code? Yeah, real quick. Um, so basically, uh, what I'm doing is, is I first take a picture, and I'll kind of go through the code. So this is all in MATLAB. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this of course. is all just MATLAB generated. Um, and, and the first thing I'm doing, there's some. Just kind of explain each little bit. But this is just basically clearing your variables. If you had anything in the maze that, that the maze created last time, it might screw it up. Um, and these are just some variables. Like I said, I have a you know an ending position, which is my target, and my starting position, which I'm not using the starting position anymore. When I was first originally figuring out how to solve just any maze, I was importing just a, an image of a maze. So I wasn't messing with the, with the webcam or anything like that. And so I had to tell it, okay, I want to start here and I want to end here, figure out how to get there. Um, and then basically it goes through a couple different things where, uh, <coughs> let me see if I can do it real quick with uh, image you have. With an image. <laughs> You know what, now it's not going to work. I have changed too much. But anyway, um, so you go through here, and the first step is, is to get our video image. Um, so we assign uh, a variable to our video input, and then we basically take a snapshot of that image. Um, from there, uh, from there, I'm basically resizing the image. Uh, and this is kind of dealing with some of the original restrictions that I dealt with. Sorry, there might be uh, there might be notes to myself in this code that, that might not be user friendly, so I apologize in advance. Um, but anyway, yeah, like for example, my my button. Sorry, I'm really slow and I need more time. That, that's anyway. Um, so basically, I first resize the image, and this is dealing with my original constraints that I was building this program based off of an image file, um, and so I wanted my webcam image to be the same size and dimensions as that because. Whenever we take a picture of, uh, of something, um, we can basically decompose that into a matrix of numbers. Um, consisting, if it's a color uh, image, then it's a matrix three rows deep, each uh, pertaining to a color red, green, or blue. Um, and each with a value between 1 and 250, or 0 and 255, uh, depending on the intensity of that color. Um, so, so when we first take this picture, we get this image or this uh, matrix. And uh, from there, we need to say, okay, well, what is the actual size of this? Well, we don't need to do that now because I've already specified the size of it. Um, but uh, but then we determine how many color bands uh, this image has. If it's a if it's an image file and it's pure black and white, then it won't have any color bands. It'll just be one uh, dimension thick. Uh, but ever but if we're taking a picture from the webcam, we need to discern whether or not we need to turn that image into monochrome or if it's already in monochrome, basically. Um, so from there, we create a mono image um, by taking the strongest of the three layers and utilizing just that layer as a black and white. Um, so then, with our with our mono image, like I said, we're just in black and white, and uh, then we can then I scale the image to get from ones to zero to two fifty five to just zeros or ones. Uh, so then I, it becomes a binary image, if you will. Um, so I'm converting black and white, which is 1, 0, 255, to just, if it's black, it's a 0. If it's white, it's a 1. Um, then what I'm doing is I'm inverting that image. 
And, and the purpose for this is because if, if your ball is a certain size, let's say let's say my ball is this size, um, I might have uh, you know a maze ball here and a maze ball here. But that ball can't fit through those. And so when I invert the image, the rest of the image now is black, and I have these white walls. And with MATLAB, we can use a command called dilate, which basically makes anything that, that we want uh, to, to grow, to grow all around it. So these walls uh, would start out this thick, and they would dilate and become thicker now, certain, by a certain amount. Um, and this way, if the walls touch, it closes off the area between it, letting me know that I can't calculate a path down there. Because if it's even one pixel wide, it, it can potentially calculate a path through it. Uh, but the ball can't fit through one pixel wide, obviously. So you spread these walls out, and so if it's too too narrow for the ball to fit through, then the walls will touch, eliminating any of the white between them. So that's the first step: is we dilate the image. Um, and then, how, do you, how do you not dilate a good path close? You, you know well, because you're dilating by a certain amount. Um, so, for example, like you know, I might have a I redraw this. If I have, you know, a wall here and, and a wall here, um, this ball can fit through. So when it dilates, I don't know if you can see. So this. did you set your dilation yes. for so the size of the ball? Yes. Okay. So I have my dilation mm -hmm. amount, uh, or the amount that I want to dilate, set by the diameter, the diameter of the ball that I'm using. Um, and so that way. You know, when it dilates, it will dilate the ends of these walls so they come to right here and just leave a little path. And that also gets me the center path between these walls. Um, so anyway, and then it, uh, for the first part, it tells you to set up the maze walls. And uh, that's basically, it takes a picture, turns it to a binary image, and then stops. And it tells you to put the ball on the maze. So it takes another image and basically goes through the exact same process that I said, except uh, then it does background subtraction. And uh, for any of you that don't know, that's whenever you have uh, one image and another image where only one thing has changed. When you subtract those matrices, all that's left is the item that has changed. So when you put the ball on the maze, it subtracts the two, and all that's left is that ball. And uh, from that, we can take an average of the cells wide that it says that ball is and find the center of it. Mm -hmm. okay. So then once we've found out the position of the ball, I have a couple different things here, like while the maze, uh, maze the, the current position that you're in is less than 9999990000. And, uh, and that number is so big because I was finding there's a lot of little steps to take whenever you're trying to figure out a, a map or a, a maze. Because uh, you know, just like we were saying, you might uh, have a, you know, one here, two, three, four, five, and uh, all these are basically building out from here. Well, this might actually be 10,000 steps to get to your target point. And, uh, sorry, go ahead, Kim. Is uh, each step considered a pixel? Um, in, found this, a... in this case, it is, um, and that's only because I've resized. Um, if I left the image and it's Initial aspect ratio. Uh, each step would have to be you know, three or four pixels, but uh, but because I've resized my original picture that I took, now I can have each step be one pixel. Um, you could do the same with, with a larger image, but you're going to require a lot more processing. Mm -hmm. It just depends on on the accuracy that you need. If, if I was you know trying to get a, a PB through this, I would want to probably go with a higher aspect ratio and have a, a lot higher number of counts. But because my ball is big enough. I can kind of dumb that or basically scale that down a little bit. I don't need the accuracy, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and this number, I had to go through and change it countless times because that's why it's nine and then it gets to zeros because it was all right. It, it crashed on me. Let's add a couple more nines. Let's add a couple. More, all right, let's just add five more zeros to it. Can you just make that number be one more than the number of pixels you have? Because it couldn't. Is well, it true that it couldn't possibly be more than? The thing, it can be more than the number of pixels. Because if you think it has to it, backtrack on itself. Well, let's say that you know you go through all these different positions. So you have this many pixels wide. Well, if you're calculating this path down, over, up, down, up, down, like all these
these different routes. So it can essentially be a, an infinite amount of steps. It what, can, can it backtrack? Can it go back on itself? Can it go, I don't know. Yeah, could it, could it be go here, 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 and then go here, 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 where you've just been? No. So, so, so yeah, it couldn't be more than the total number of pixels. Yeah, Not the pixel oh, width or saying, pixel okay, height. Yeah, then the total, okay, you're saying, I thought you meant the total number of pixels in one way. Yes. Yeah. So if you were to multiply, if you had, uh, you know, um, 720 by 480 and multiply that, that's actually good, and I didn't think about that. So I have to modify my program to reflect that. Um, so basically, the, the first step, in it, and it's pretty ugly uh, written, um, it's still in the basic stages of, of the program, and this would be much faster or much cleaner written in different functions. So basically, because you're repeating four steps basically over and over until you find this final part. So what I've got it doing is it says, uh, while your maze position does not equal this number. And then I've also set up my target to equal that number. So I know that whenever it finds, gets to a cell that, that has that value in it, it knows that it's at the finish. Um, so basically what I say is, uh, so we have a current, and we have what's called our next on list. Current is the current cell that you're in. The next on list is, uh, remember when I was talking about breath first searching, where it says, okay, I'm here, and I've got these three open cells. Well, add those three open cells to my next list, basically. Um, and so I can't do all those at the same time unless I have multi or multiple processors or hyper-threading or something like that. Um, so basically, uh, I've said, okay, well, the left is clear of me. All right, that's next on my list. The top is clear of me. All right, that's next after that left. One. The right is clear of me. That's third after those three. Um, and then, so then it would get to this, go to the left one, and then calculate, okay, well, I have this one, this one, or this one open. And that would add to the end of the list overall. Um, so basically, it says, if, you're, if the maze, the current position, is equal is is equal to this uh, is equal to my target then break which is basically end that little portion of loop. Um, otherwise, if the current position um, is if the surrounding positions are equal to one, then I know that that's a potential path I can take. If it's not equal to one, then it's not. So I say here, okay, if current one minus one, which is my current position, minus one, so I'm going down, and my current x position is equal to one, then I can assign it, uh, then I can go into the next part. And I say maze current one minus one current two is equal to the current cell that I'm in value plus one. So basically it goes through and it does this a number of times and it repeats that loop over and over and so it finds my target position. Then it sets uh, just an iteration counter to, to a high number um, because And so then it just kind of says, okay, this is the number of steps it takes to get here and then exactly. it optimizes. So, yeah, exactly. And then once it has gotten to its end position, now your current is updated with your, uh, your new where you're at right now, and it goes back the opposite direction, and it says, okay, well, are any of these cells one less than my current value? And if it is, if any of those three are, then it can move to that one. And then it says, all right, well, which one is one less than my current position, and it can move to that one. Um, and I have it, it's basically, if it, it just goes in an order of left, or left, top, sorry, left, right, top, bottom. It doesn't really matter which way you are, because as I showed before, you know, there's multiple different directions that you can take that are still the same distance. So, but as well, long as they're still the same Manhattan distance, exactly, they're not necessarily the same. Exactly, still mm -hmm. the same Manhattan distance. Uh, and so, it doesn't really matter which one I take first. If there's just one cell with one number less than me, that I know I'm on a, one of the right paths. Um, so basically, it just does that uh, until it goes all the way through. Um, and it's uh, constantly adding to another uh, matrix these different positions that it goes through. Once it does that, it gets to the end and, uh, and it builds a, uh, an overlay of the original image which displays a red line of the correct path. 
And so what's in the process now is taking that path and turning it into an actual movement of, of some ball or, or something uh, to follow that path. So, which hopefully you guys will see soon. Cool. So, but that's pretty much the most of my presentation. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.